um, I was going through you know some sort of issue, and it was talking about success and business and all that. And but I was agitated. I, I don't have a very like strong amount of peace in me. And I think that's the other side of temperance, if you will. And I was going through uh, some things with Dr. Kevin and Dr. Kevin stopped me. He's like, Bryce, I know you're, you're sometimes frustrated with your restlessness, if you will. But if I take a step back, if I took that away from you, would you be happy? And I'm like, whoa, 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 Dr. Kevin, wait, wait take, a, take my ambition, take my locked onness, take my obsession away. No, 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 no. That is the source of my strength. And he says, I get that, Bryce. He's like, then you're just going to have to shake hands and be okay with it. Welcome to the Fitness CEO Podcast, a show dedicated to helping fitness entrepreneurs launch and grow successful gyms. Here's your host, Bryce Henson. Hey friends, welcome back to another amazing episode of the Fitness CEO Podcast. And this is part two, that's right, dos or dois in Brazilian Portuguese, if you are Brazilian watching this, uh, from my last uh, sh uh, podcast shoot um, on, which was part one of my Q&A uh, that uh, I presented at Matt Wilbur's Domination Workshop in Grand Rapids, Michigan for um, a list of awesome franchise partners. And um, I would highly encourage you if you have not watched part one. This probably won't fully make sense. It's still going to be a lot of value, which is great, uh, but it creates some congruency. I would highly encourage you to uh, watch part one first, uh, which are the first seven questions that he interviewed me uh, in front of a live audience to be able to, to unpeel the onion on how I was able to go from this kid in the Midwest uh, from very humble beginnings for first world standards where my family used to run out of money before he used to run out of a month and Taco Bell and fast food was a staple on my diet. Fitness had nowhere, no place in the equation, uh, then transforming into a certified personal trainer after I moved to California, getting fit, going through my own transformation, and then launching one uh, fit body location, which uh, spanned to a handful of locations that became the VP and then ultimately became the CEO of the brand. So um, really uh, still feel a little serendipitous, serendipitous as I, I even say this out loud. Um, but that all in mind, the, va the value of, I guess, uh, the content that I created at Domination Workshop is typically I'm presenting and and uh, you know, choreographing or setting up the event. And this event was awesome because I was there as a participant learning and gaining value with the one caveat that Matt asked me. He wanted to do an interview with me to really uh, glean some leadership lessons, at least from my experience, and impart that you know to our franchise partners. And we did. Um, There's 15 questions he asked me. It was about an hour long. It took, um, yeah, it took about an hour in terms of the dialogue. And uh, the f it was not recorded. As it turns out, the videographer on site had some sort of issue on day two, so could not come and, and shoot that. So uh, one of my franchise partners, dear friend, came up to me afterwards like, Bryce, that was an incredible, incredible, um, you know, I guess, uh, interview that you were able to provide content. I would highly encourage you to package up some of those questions and deliver that on the Fitness CEO podcast. So I did for part one. I'm going to continue on with the last, the latter half of the seven questions and that way to give you some good tangible takeaways from my lens and my story on questions asked by me from um, our number one most financial successful franchise partner out in West Michigan who launched 10 locations, multi, multi, multi uh, million dollar uh, business uh, that he operates there. And um, certainly had a lot of emotion as a light off audience, but I'm basically following up to give you the tangible takeaways to help your leadership, help your entrepreneurship so that way you can grow your business. So the next question where I left off was backstory. And interestingly enough, uh, B&I, which I referenced in part one as well, um, shot a podcast where he interviewed me. So I was able to tell, tell a little bit of backstory but I'll color in a few of the details because there's one thing I didn't uh, get the opportunity to share in that particular episode when you watch that. But Bryce, your backstory, what part of your story growing up do you feel was the most painful but has the greatest impact on, on you today? And then what parts of your childhood drive you to this day? And then what advice would you give the little Bryce? So I typically say that I'm from the Midwest, which would be partly true. I spent 11 years of there uh, in, in um, the latter half of grammar school, high school, and then I graduated from uh, university there. But the first 10 years of life was spent in Atlanta, Georgia. And I used to talk like this because I lived in the suburbs about a half an hour south, and this is in the late 80s. So uh, the area was much more, uh, much less developed than what it is today. And uh, it was volatile because uh, my father um, was a drug addict, uh, addicted to 
alcohol and addicted to gambling, the trifecta not necessarily conducive for a, a good family upbringing. And uh, it was certainly volatile. My first uh, house was a double wide, um, which is interesting. I'm giving a keynote in our Orlando Mastermind, uh, just talking about some of the, the the learning lessons of kind of the the challenges of living in that particular environment. But it wasn't always bad. Actually, my family, my father's father, my grandfather won an inheritance. So it was a couple years actually that seemed to be really good. Um, but the addiction and the arguments both verbally and then ultimately became physical became too much to handle. And um, I will recommend that you watch the interview podcast with B and I to, to get the full story. But long story short, virtually overnight, my mother uh, decided to move to Michigan to escape with her three kids. And uh, for the better part of a decade, uh, thank God for my grandma. But we live with my grandma who um, had a, a very humble but clean three-bedroom um I guess, manufactured home. And my brother and I shared a room. My uh, grandma had one room. And then my mom and my sister shared a room in a bed, actually, for the better, better part of 10 years. And uh, for the following, those 10 years, um, we used to run out of money before we used to run out of month. Uh, for first world standards is very humble. And I always preface first world standards because I had the opportunity to live in South America for the better part of two years, from the years of 2010 to 2012. And at that point is what I saw what real poverty looked like, real, real humble beginnings for third world standards. And my friends, if you're watching this in North America or from a first world country, I will um, politely but very um, accurately point out there's a big difference in terms of the first world and the third world in terms of standards of living. And I'll leave it at that. Uh, but that all said, um, you know, being ripped away from my father, having a, a relationship there and, um, you know, running out of money before he used to run out of month and the stress and the anxiety and seeing my mom, you know, scared and cry and nervous when I was a young boy, it, it really had a big impact on me. And I became very self-aware. I learned at a very young age that if it has to be, it's up to me. My friends, that's my message for you. No one is coming on a white horse to save you. No one is coming to save you. People are there to support you and help you and guide you. But you, my friend, have to save yourself. And that was a big learning lesson that I learned at a very young age. And interestingly, the other part of that equation was even though it was a very challenging situation, my uncle uh, believed in uh, education. So even though my f financial, my family was not f uh, supportive financially, my uncle did not support the fi family financially, but he believed in private school and good education. Um, so uh, there I was, uh, very, very out of place uh, from a socioeconomic perspective. And I didn't understand at this time. I didn't learn until after I graduated high school that my uncle funded a good ma majority of my private school. Um, and certainly very grateful for that. And number one, it gave me a very unique look to create drive and ambition to continue to move on. And the reason I say this is two things. Number one, I was surrounded by wealth um, going to a private school. And I think that was good in, for, for one reason. It showed me what was possible. Uh, in fact, I have a house here in Southern California that has epox, epoxy floors, like the finished floors that you see in a car room showroom. And my wife, when she was seeing the house, she knew that that was the house initially because one of my uh, best friends growing up, his name was Brandon, I actually was saw him in the same particular time frame where we at the Domination Workshop uh, because I grew up in Michigan for those 11 years. And Brandon uh, came from a very wealthy family and he had epoxy floors. And I remember being, being a little kid and being like, holy smokes, his floors you can eat your dinner off of. That is the sign of wealth. When I grow up, I'm going to have epoxy floors on my garage. So I share this with you because it showed me by being surrounded in that influence, it showed me what was possible. And I feel sometimes there's a big dif di disadvantage. And it's certainly changing with social media and the internet age that we live in. But when people are uh, born in extreme poverty um, or, you know, deeply in the inner city as an example, their surroundings, they don't actually have visual, visualization of what's actually possible. They think, hey, this is just the life that I'm destined to live. So from that aspect, I gained a lot of um, vision to what was possible in the future and it benefited me. On the flip side, what created a lot of angst and jealousy and friction, I guess, if you will, and emotions of... Um, challenging emotions that I ended up channeling towards the po uh, positive as I throw my mic here. But people are, are you know, creatures of comparison. So I show I was shown what was actually possible when you're comparing yourself and everyone in the class, seemingly everyone in, in your area has significantly more than you. And you're looked at as like, 
the kind of charity case, even though it probably wasn't said in that direct uh, you know, communication, it was felt, right? That created this angst and this desire to be more, to serve more, to uh, live better and live more. And I think that dichotomy of, of being shown what was possible, but also the negative feelings of feeling less than created this massive level of emotion. And I realized at a very young age that this would never happen to me again from a financial perspective. And I was going to learn whatever it took, like taking a whatever it takes mentality to be the best version I possibly can of me to be able to be financially successful and be the provider for my family. So that was a very unique, interesting look at life and the volatility that came with that, um, but also the blessings that came from that. I'm a huge believer in Stoic philosophy, uh, which I'll probably talk about in one of my later questions. And the essence of Stoic is uh, Stoicism is really figuring out what's in your control and what's not in your control and taking massive action only at the things within your control and consuming yourself with that and disregarding anything outside of your control. And um, I think that uh, is a big, big lesson that has served me well, um, you know, throughout the, the course of, you know, my leadership and my business acumen, if you will. It's, Stoicism also teaches it's not what happens to you, okay? It's the response, okay, that you can control. And I love this analogy of a fire, right? And, and the, the fire is a burning flame and debris and wood and brush symbolize the obstacles, if you will. Now, if you ever seen a fire that gets thrown on debris and brush and wood and all these additional quote unquote obstacles, if you will, you will notice that the fire does not cry. The fire does not say, poor me, okay, pity me, these circumstances, these obstacles. Okay, the fire does the exact opposite. The fire says, okay, great, okay, I'm going to take these obstacles, this brush, this, you know, um, brush fire and this wood and this debris, and I'm actually going to make this fuel to the fire, to my fire, to be able to allow me to grow bigger and brighter and bolder and be the light, okay, the shining uh, light, um, if you will. And we become better for this. And I think that was really the attitude that I took going through that particular situation. And again, the dichotomy that I shared. So really, uh, the, the quote unquote tragedy that was really a blessing, it was disguised as a tra tragedy, is in essence, uh, a framework for how to think stoically and how to be successful in life. And I really think stoicism is the philosophy of the successful. Uh, so that all said, to put a bow on this and kind of bring this full circle, that backstory, that challenge, that adversity, that quote unquote tragedy, which was actually a blessing, uh, turned out to be the biggest blessing. And that was the foundation of my backstory to really lead me to where I'm at today. So from your lens, my friend, think back to yourself. You know, there was a challenge, there's adversity um, that you've gone through. Have you really looked at it in a favorable way? Have you changed the story to say, hey, this is not hurting me. This is actually serving me. Because if you haven't, I think there's an opportunity there and you're going to need to take that opportunity, especially if you want to grow the best fitness business and having the most impact um, in your community. Uh, so that is my backstory. And uh, the, my advice uh, to little Bryce uh, would be realize that this quote unquote tragedy is going to be your biggest blessing. Continue to take action. Never take a woe is me mentality. And when you do that, when you are a good person, when you continue to develop your character, um, you will be followed by people that want to be part of your mission, that, be, that want to be part of that burning flame and that bright brightness that you can offer the world. Uh, so that would be my advice. And certainly that is also my advice for you. All right. Uh, that was uh, question nine, which again, as we continue on from part two, uh, question 10, Bryce, what are the top three biggest leadership lessons you have learned as CEO? Um, well, certainly COVID was a kick in the butt. And uh, depending on what state uh, our franchise partners win in the jurisdiction had a lot of different challenges that went with it. So my first leadership lesson, what I would say is having a control of your own emotions, having strong emotional int intelligence. And I actually think larger than most technical uh, skill sets, this is going to be your biggest deciding factor, whether you're going to be a successful entrepreneur and business owner. And it definitely is me from a CEO perspective. Am I perfect? Do I have perfect emotional intelligence? No. However, am I really strong? I am. And that's only getting stronger by the day. Because what happens is in my role as CEO of an international fitness franchise, everything's magnified 
to scale, okay? My strengths, people think I'm bigger than I am in a positive way, but also my weaknesses are also magnified as well. Every little mistake and error that I make is magnified and for for good form. Like I took this uh, responsibility and I I accepted the job function, if you will, so I knew what I was getting into going in. Um, But that's a huge uh, learning lesson from a leadership perspective. You have to be in control, okay? Not the other way, not the circumstances, not the outcomes. Um, And when you walk into your boardroom, you actually need to be predictable. And I was going through actually a, a situation with one of my teammates, one of my leaders, uh, who's an incredible leader. She's actually the integrator of our company and had a, a little, uh, I guess, a miscommunication, if you will, with one of our teammates. And it would have been very easy for her to be like, what the heck, Bryce? Why did you communicate this? Get really frustrated with this. But she knew my cadence of communication. She knows how predictable I am. And for the longest time, I actually thought when, when I heard that, hey, Bryce, you're predictable was a very negative thing, but from a leadership perspective, from emotional intelligence perspective, you want to be predictable. You want to have your emotions so in control and check where, yeah, you can get fiery. Like I'm passionate. I'm in fiery. I'm in, I show enthusiasm, but I'm always in control of that. And that's a huge learning lesson that I want to impart on you as a, as a future or a current business owner. Um, the next up is knowledge. Uh, interestingly enough, my job as the CEO, when I thought for a long time and probably more so being the CEO of my local fitness businesses, um, my Fit Body Bootcamp locations, uh, one location that I own now, um, but I scaled to five, as you know. For a long time, I thought I had to know everything as a leader. And the reality of the situation is that's not the case at all. In my previous episode of part one, I talked about the who, not the what. So finding out the who can do this. And again, I'm in with a studio with my man, Pablo. This guy can shoot magic, can record, can edit, can really make beautiful art, okay? I have no idea how to do any of that it's literally a foreign language to me. However, I love Pablo. I can pour into them. I can work with him and I can show him a vision of where we're going and how his role has a massive impact on the, the greater good and the mission to inspire fitness and change lives every day, which is our global mission of Fit Body Bootcamp. So really what I'm trying to articulate here is my job in the learning lesson, the leadership perspective is I don't need to know everything. I don't need to know the what and everything, but I need to have a strong mission, a strong vision, pour into people. And I have to have the ability to recruit the who, not necessarily the what, in order to be an effective leader. And again, that takeaway is directly will uh, directly impact your leadership and your uh, entrepreneurship in a very positive way. Um, the last is humility. Um, and interesting, the question was framed, there was a follow-up question in the dialogue, of course, I'm just shooting this as a solo episode right now, uh, but it was talking about guarding your time and learning lessons, and the third learning lesson, uh, leadership lesson, is really having a high degree of humility, because the question was like, Bryce, you have a lot of people want to attack your time, attack your agenda, if you will, and really the email box coming in is a to-do list created for you by other people, um, and as I continue to um, grow the organization, have a bit more no- notoriety, more inquiries come in far different than when I first started in 2012. And assuming that I continue on this trajectory, trajectory, which is the plan, uh, that will only continue. But if I want to take a step back and from a leadership perspective, realize that you have to humble yourself. No one likes to deal with like this egocentric tyrant leader. That is just not the case. If my buddy Pablo was like, hey, Bryce, the vision for us to change the logo. And I would say, Pablo, you're an idiot, which I would never do. He would be like, screw you, Bryce. Like, what the heck? I'm not going to go for this. That, that'd be a horrible leader to follow. Okay. So as a leader, you have to have humility. You have to realize that sometimes your idea is not the best idea and you're not in the business of always having to create the best idea. You're in the business of actually having to aggregate that, uh, the best idea and actually compile it and then f- adopt the best idea in the room. It might not be yours and attack that idea to get the people, get your team, get your people on board behind that vision. And um, interestingly enough, it, it comes back with humility. So I think it's been a very, very um, you know, strong um, or a very valuable learning lesson to understand that if you want to lead a, a strong organization, you have to be humble. And you also have to understand, and I look at this from the president perspective, when any president, you know, takes office, typically speaking, what they realize when they exit office, it's not necessarily that they were the greatest person ever and they deserved all the accolades and the spotlight from being the president of the United States. Specifically, the, the title, the role is what held the authority, not 
not necessarily that person. And of course, my job is to be an, a, an effective leader who has high moral integrity that people want to follow because of me as a person, not necessarily the role. But you also have to understand as a leader uh, perspective, sometimes the glitz, if you will, and the glamour that comes with it is because of the role. You have to humble yourself, Mr. Henson. And that's a message that I give myself and want to give you. What's up, my friend? Bryce here. Now, you might know me as the co-host of this podcast and the CEO of FitBody. But what many people don't know is that I actually began my journey as a FitBody franchise owner. Now, being an owner, I wake up every day absolutely doing what I love. I live my passion. I help people transform their lives and have both financial and personal freedom. And it's for these reasons and many more that other owners join the brand and open their own FitBody locations too. So if you're looking to build a highly profitable business, take charge of your life, and create an impact in your very own community, then opening a FitBody gym might be a perfect fit for you. Now to see if a territory is available in your area, as we have very limited spots due to our incredible growth, go ahead and visit our website at fbbcfranchise.com to complete an application. Well, thanks, and back to the show. All right, moving along, next question. What are the top three things you are trying to get better at with your leadership, and what do you think uh, is most important? Uh, so the top three things that I'm currently working on is my work obsession. And it's interesting, it's the same force on the other side. I'm a recovering alcoholic. I believe I shared with that. If I didn't, I am a recovering drug addict. Uh, and it's not something I'm just super excited to talk about, but it is the truth. Now, um, it has a, it has had very negative consequences in my life, but also has very positive. I'm addicted to work. I'm addicted to serve. I'm addicted to know. K-N-O-W, K meaning the addictive of, of, uh, of knowledge, if you will. And that's a good thing, but I would say that's also a double-edged sword. So if I'm being very candid, sometimes uh, the closest people in my circle, aka my wife, Tatiana, my mother, Donna, and my brother, Barrett, um, sometimes uh, need a little bit more personal connection, if you will, uh, instead of me focusing completely on my work obsession. So that certainly has a lot of benefit, especially to my franchise and my team here at HQ and our franchise partners that I'm just completely locked on. Uh, but it's something that I'm working on. And you don't want to be a leader that's like extremely successful. He's an awesome organization, but it's just burned all your uh, you know family, familiar and your uh, familial relationships and your personal relationships. So there's a balance there. And that's a number one I'm working on. Number two is too fast. And there's a famous quote saying, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And that is wisdom. And I think of the, like that playing the long game as well, but I'm a high energy, high octane guy. I'm a very high, uh, um, eagle when it comes to the personality, the disc assessment, which we shot in the other episode. I'm also a secondary uh, parrot. And parrots usually take massive action. They don't have everything fit, figured out, uh, which is great because they're life of the party. They can connect. They bring energy, enthusiasm, uh, but sometimes details get missed. Uh, so sometimes I need to take a step back and realize that slow is smooth and smooth is, smooth is fast, and that's wisdom. That's also an opportunity. The running joke in my leadership team and my business execution team is I stack myself with owls, and owls uh, from the personality uh, assessment are very highly analytical. They're very detail-oriented. That does not come naturally to me. Me. So things that I'm working on to some extent, uh, but really more importantly, I'm delegating and really making sure that I find um, people with high owl and just you know skill sets that really complement me and really make up for my weaknesses. Uh, so I am working on slowing it down, taking a deep breath at times. And lastly, I continue to work on is my character. And um, I enrolled in a 12-step program in uh, the very end of 2016. It's been one of the biggest benefits of my life in COVID through things for a loop and I'm still trying to get back on a, um, a meeting schedule that's consistent with my new house that I got at the end of that last year. So there's still some things I'm working through, but really what I realized at this 12-step program, which was just mind-blowing for the first time that I learned this because I went in the program to stop drinking alcohol and I'll never forget when they, the gentleman said, this is a program of rigorous honesty. I'm thinking to myself, what in the heck does honesty have to do with not drinking alcohol? And then through the course of time, I realized it has everything to, stop, to do with stop drinking alcohol. And really, the, any 12-step program is a program of, of growth and of actually building your character. And uh, certainly when I was younger, um, 
I, I credit my mother for being able to teach me uh, the ways of valuing people. And certainly I always thought I was a good person, but there's definitely big character flaws, you know, I had in the past and I'm still working those through and a way better man than I've ever been on this planet, but I still have a ways to go. Uh, what I've learned from a leadership perspective, um, that the stronger character you have, the deeper the foundation and the bigger infrastructure you can build, the biggest, bigger impact and mission that you can serve. And I thought for a long period of time when I was younger that like rich people as an example, they're cheating and they're they're greedy and they're stealing. And there are some rich people that, that are that way, but I would say the vast majority of strong leaders that build incredible organizations, they have strong, strong, incredibly strong character. And for me, that's mission critical and it's so important. So um, I st- I've come a long way for developing my ca- character. I still have th- some things to work through, um, but I have a duty, obligation, responsibility to you, uh, to the people that I serve, to my team, to my audience, to my global clients, to continue to work on my character. And I'm going to continue to have uh, big wins, also missteps as well, but it's about getting back, um, you know, getting off the mats when you fall down. And for me, working, continuing to build my character is going to be a lifelong endeavor and that's mission critical to be able to lead not only a team in a massive organization like Fit Body Bootcamp, but also to be able to lead myself. And my friend, that is a really, really big takeaway for you. All right, moving along. And I got a few minutes left with you for today. But uh, next thing is top three things I've learned from B. And that was a great question Matt asked me. So number one, I would say marketing is the number one skill of influence. And he said this to me one time and he's like, Bryce, I, I'll never forget this actually. He's like, Bryce, the problem is most fitness business owners, they think they are the CEO first and a marketer second. And then it's just such wrong and bad thinking if you really want to scale and grow a profitable business, uh, whether it be a local Fit Body Bootcamp or a massive organization. As the leader of the business, you have to understand you are the chief marketing officer first and foremost, and you're a CEO second. Your job is needs to be, the, be able to market your business and be able to, from a leadership perspective, bring on other people that can fill the gap. So from that perspective, Perspective, seeing B's incredible influence, um, and then you know catching a lot of lessons uh, throughout the way. That is definitely number one. Uh, marketing is number one um, in the priority list. Number two, vulnerability creates connection. And I'll never uh, forget you know when I first met B and started seeing him on stages. This was in 2012 and 2013. I thought it found it very interesting. He talked about his problems. He talked about his insecurities. His um, his issues, his vulnerabilities, you know, coming from escaping communist, um, you know, the Soviet Union and arriving in Southern California, living in Section 8 housing and having gasoline poured in his hair uh, from his mom who wanted to cure his head for lice, but they didn't have any money. And I thought to myself, that is crazy that he's actually sharing all these things. But the weirdest thing is, I feel more connected. And uh, that is so true. In fact, after delivering this live interview, a dear friend of mine, her name's Courtney. She's the owner of a Fit Body Bootcamp actually in Fayetteville, Georgia. I'm going to give you a shout out, Courtney, if you're watching this. She comes up to me afterwards and with Barrett and Matt, she's like, I feel you're like my brother. And interestingly, we have a very interesting and similar backstory. There's a lot of like very, very strong nuances and similarities. But I think the biggest thing that she thought that the, the, the reason I should say is because my willingness to share my vulnerabilities, my challenges, my suffer with alcoholism and being a drug addict and just a lot of like challenges that we all face. And to realize that for the longest period of time I thought, and I still fight it to this day that I got to like be here and present myself in the most perfect fashion and, you know, fr- from that optics. And that's important. You have to have professionalism. You have to look the part. You have to be prepared. These are all things that we, we talked about, okay? And we'll continue to teach. But really what I realized is that if I can show my chinks in the armor, if I can show my vul- vulnerability abilities and my insecurities and things that I'm still working on, which believe me, my friends, there are many and they're vast. What I do is I open up a human connection because guess what? If you're listening to this, you're not perfect. You are flawed. Okay. And when I share my, my, my imperfections and my vulnerabilities, it actually creates a more of a human, a human, a humanistic touch. And to kind of put a bow on this particular aspect, we we'll use an example that we can all understand Superman. Superman is the most boring character in the history of comic books, in the history of the world, without kryptonite. It's only when kryptonite is introduced is when the story becomes interesting. And then you can actually connect with Superman on that level. And B taught me that. 
And I'm super grateful for that. My last bullet point is that I admire B is to stand up for what you believe. Whether you love him, whether you hate him, you're not just going to tolerate him. Um, he says what he thinks and he thinks what he says and he, he'll get on this, his, his pulpit for that. And I'll give you some you know, v- very granular uh, a, a example of this. When the COVID-19 pandemic came down. And by the way, uh, this should never have been political. And I don't mean to get political here because I'm not. This is a medical issue where the, the vision here is to be able to spread health and wellness, inspire fitness and change lives every day, which is the mission of this particular podcast. But interesting, all the restrictions that basically inhibited our franchise partners to run their business and be able to offer good advice. In fact, the, the advice of lock yourself and stay in place is the exact opposite from a health and fitness perspective. And especially as the data show now a couple years in advance. But interestingly enough, from the very beginning, B would start a hit on this. And he'd been to communists, he'd lived through communism. And while I agreed on a lot of things, if I'm being very honest with you, there were some of them I wasn't totally sure, especially at that period of time. But there B was basically standing his pulpit and then standing up for what he believed in. And um, I just have a lot of admiration. And um, whether you agree with him, whether you don't agree with him, that's actually irrelevant. The, the principle that I really want to take um, and showcase and, and provide you a takeaway is you need to stand up for what you believe. And I'd like to credit myself. I do that. Um, but there's an opportunity for myself and you to continue to do that at a higher fashion. So that would be the bow in the top three things I learned from our man B. All right. So I'm going to finish up here with my last, what is it here? Um, two questions. Uh, number 13, if Bryce, if you can fix one thing about you, what would that be? And it's actually something that I'm working on. I kind of talked about the work obsession, but I have a hard time of turning it off. And that benefits me in a lot of ways, but um, life is dynamic and a blessing can also be your curse. Just like a curse, quote unquote, tragedy of my youth turned out to be the biggest blessing. But for me, I'm an addict by nature. I'm a huge believer in Stoic philosophy, as we know. And there's four main virtues in Stoicism. And I love Stoicism. And if you haven't followed Ron Holiday, I would definitely turn you on to him. He's an incredible uh, person and authority on that matter. And he goes through four main virtues, or he, he's really brought Stoicism to life. And he teaches on four main virtues, which are the foundation of Stoicism, which are wisdom, justice, and courage. Well, those are three. The fourth is temperance. So wisdom, pretty self-explanatory. It takes time, experience, so living in this planet. Justice, I feel like I'm factory installed. I was a referee when I was a young kid. I see things pretty fairly, um, all things considered. Um, courage, I'd like to think I'm courageous. Um, and there's room for improvement in all these things, but I have a high level of confidence in those three. But temperance, which is really the opposite of um, addiction, if you will, having temperance um, is important. And I think it's important leadership in life and balance would be another way to look at that. Um, interestingly enough, there's there's a time for balance. There's also a time for full throttle, full throttle. And I think you need to kind of weigh that, if you will. But for me, my blessing is my curse. My curse is a blessing. I'm a freaking addict. And whatever I set myself on, I lock in one million million percent. And, um, you know, in some aspects of my life, it actually hurts me. Um, so that would be one thing that I want to continue to fix myself. Although that said, I actually going to retract that. I'm going to give you visibility to Dr. Kevin, who's my therapist, who actually B turned me on to years ago. Um, I was going through, you know, some sort of issue and it was talking about success and business and all that. And, but I was agitated. I, I don't have a very like strong amount of peace in me. And I think that's the other side of temperance, if you will. And I was going through uh, some things with Dr. Kevin and Dr. Kevin stopped and he's like, Bryce, I know you're, you're sometimes frustrated with your restlessness, if you will. But if I take a step back, if I took that away from you, would you be happy? And I'm like, whoa, 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 Dr. Kevin, wait, wait take, a, take my ambition, take my locked onness, take my obsession away. No, 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 no. That is the source of my strength. And he says, I get that, Bryce. He's like, then you're just going to have to shake hands and be okay with it. So that all said, um, I think it's something factory installed that I continue to work on and get better. And I'll gain more wisdom with time and probably more temperance with time as well. And I want to fix it. But at the end of the day, it's also my, um, I feel like it's my zone of genius. So it's something that I'm going to continue to monitor and shake hands with. And I'll encourage you to do the same, whatever that is for you. Last question to finish this off, my friends, is Bryce, you are incredibly hard on yourself. How can this be a good and a bad thing? 
it really is the the a similar type answer um but in stoicism they have this philosophy to be hard on yourself and to patient with other others and i think there's a lot of value to that especially from a leadership framework um i lack peace i have a constant state of a little bit of agitation and that's just something that i need to shake hands with uh, but the value here Okay, and the big takeaway is that no one will ever have a higher expectation of myself than I put on myself. You know, my co-host B, I've just been chatting uh, about his, you know, greatness, um, you know, and with certain, uh, I guess, points that I've articulated here. And he's brought me in. He is my business partner. He is my mentor. Um, he is a dear friend of mine. He's also my boss, too. Um, interestingly enough, we've only had a couple points of friction in you know, working together from a, a HQ perspective since 2018. And the grand scheme of things, very, very easy to work with. And of course, I'd like to think I execute extremely well. And the takeaway here and why we're able to work together so well is that B will never have a higher expectation of myself, of the role I have, the position I have as CEO of Fit Body Bootcamp than I have of myself. And when you show up with the highest level of expectation for yourself, and when you're hardest on yourself than you are to others, from a leadership perspective, actually both up the chain and down the chain of leadership, you'll always win because you're always going to show up with more energy, more preparation, more enthusiasm, more willingness to lock on and, and add value to organization that's ever been, that will be ever expected uh, from you, from your peers, from your mentors, from your higher ups, from your low up, lower ups. And when you attack life in that way, it served me well. And I would highly implore you, implore you to do that the same philosophy, adopt that same philosophy in your entrepreneur and ownership you know, experience when you become a Fit Body Bootcamp owner or when you, when you become, when you launch whatever business that you are. So my friends, uh, that is the last bullet point here. It's both a good and a bad thing. The bad thing is I lack peace, um, but the good thing is certainly move mountains. And from a leadership perspective, from an organizational perspective, it's helped me along uh, in the process. So without further ado, this puts a bow on part two. And I know you got a ton of value. Uh, so assuming you did, give us a like, give us a subscribe on YouTube, write us an awesome review on iTunes, and better yet, drop your biggest takeaway in the comments, but not even takeaway, something that you implement because we'd love to continue to engage. So with all that said, uh, Pablo, appreciate you, buddy, and friends, we'll see you in the next episode. 